I'd remind all brothers that this call will be recorded and viewable at a later time. Uh, we do plan to live stream this. And that will have that video content there as well. Um, we are having some issues with the current feed right at the second, getting it going up. Um, if we're not able to make it immediately live, the video will be posted to the Grand Lodge Facebook page at a later time. It is my honor and pleasure now to turn it over to our guest co-host for the evening, uh, Right Worshipful Brother Rick Kayser, Senior Grand Warden, and Most Worshipful Brother John Hess, Past Grand Master and Grand Historian of the Grand Lodge. Brethren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jacob. Um, as, uh, as Jacob said, I will be sharing co-hosting duties with Most Worshipful Brother Hess this evening. But I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Grand Lodge of Missouri to welcome all of you to uh, this the fourth installment in our Bicentennial Lecture Series. These lectures have been, uh, from my point of view, they've been extremely entertaining and informative. And uh, I've really been looking forward to this one in particular, both because of the subject matter and because of the special uh, guest lecture. Oops, got muted there accidentally. Um, try that again. So we welcome you all. Um, I hope you enjoy this uh, this presentation. The chat will be open through the through the presentation, but we ask that you please don't chime in with your comments while the presentation is going on. But by all means, include them on the chat, and we will get to them at the end. And uh, hopefully, we'll have some questions for. Uh, or Brother Daniel at the end. So uh, with that, I will turn this over to Most Worshipful Brother Hess. He has some information about other bicentennial events coming up and uh, he will uh, then introduce our speaker. So welcome everybody. Good evening and, and welcome. Uh, if we could bring up the uh, slide presentation for the bicentennial events, that would be great. All right. Um, we'd just like to bring you up to date of uh, what's happened and what's going to happen in, uh, in the oncoming year uh, as we celebrate our bicentennial. Um, as Red Wars McCutter said, we've had three lectures. This is the fourth lecture. And uh, we have five more that are scheduled right now. And we will have a full 12 by the time this lecture series is, is finished. Upcoming, we have a uh, a lecture on the uh, Missouri Masonic Governors, the Battleship Missouri, the Osage Indians of Missouri, early Freemasonry west of the Mississippi. General John J. Pershing will be presented by our, our Grand Master. Uh, the Grand Master has decided that we're going to try to have a statewide Zoom meeting on April 21st, 2021 to celebrate our 200th birthday. Uh, details will be coming out soon, but mark it on your calendar that we will be having a statewide uh, birthday party for the Grand Lodge of Missouri. Our Grand Lodge Public Relations Committee has just uh, come up with a bicentennial historical tour book of uh, Missouri. Uh, it will have uh, Masonic uh, Places of interest and some Masonic non-places of interest. Um, it'll be available from the Grand Lodge. Uh, uh, we're selling it at $10. It'll be available in mid-February 2021. You can order it from the Grand Lodge. It's designed that you can go to these historic sites, uh, record the dates you were there, who you were with, and what you thought about it. Um, there's 50 sites on there, and it, uh, it's all over the state, so it should be a pretty good tour. On our next slide, we uh, have finally printed our centennial and bicentennial history books, a two-volume set that will come in a sleeve. 
And uh, these also will be available uh, from the Grand Lodge for a cost of $50 for the box set plus shipping and handling, which would be $5. Uh, also in that box set, there will be a bicentennial bookmark so you can keep track of where you're at as you're going through those books. Our area meetings and bicentennial meetings right now are on hold because of COVID-19. Our Grandmaster is very anxious to try to have these uh, core occur. And as soon as uh, we get to go ahead to do that, I'm sure that he will have them scheduled um, and make everybody know when they're going to be coming up. And lastly, uh, some of you have might have seen this Bicentennial Jewel. Uh, probably not very many people have seen the uh, leather case that it goes in. Um, this will be available to, uh, you, you can't buy it, you got to attend something and the Grand Master will uh, determine what the criteria is to, uh, to actually earn that medal, but it'll be coming up in the near future. So that's what we got coming up with more surprises to follow, but uh, that's, uh, that's how we're gonna get started anyhow. At this time, I give the pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. Clifton Truman Daniels, a member of Oriental Lodge number 33 in Chicago, a member of the Ancient Accepted Scottish Rite, Northern Jurisdiction Valley of Chicago, honorary member of the Grand Lodge of Missouri in 2012. He was made a Mason at sight by the Grand Master of Illinois in 2011. Oh, and that smart. guest group might include William Howard Taft, Douglas MacArthur, Andrew Mellon. He received his Masonic degrees in Joliet, Illinois on Saturday, September, December 3rd, 2011, under a joint communication of the Grand Lodge of Illinois and the Grand Lodge of Missouri. Author of two books, Dear Harry and Love, Dear Harry Love Best, and Growing Up with My Grandfather, honorary chairman of the board of the Truman Library Institute, and puts on a wonderful one-man show, Give Him Hell Harry. And with pleasure, I introduce uh, Brother Daniel. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rick. Uh, good evening, brothers. Uh, it's nice to be here. I was, I was about to say, nice to be here with you. Would that we could, but it's, uh, it's nice to be online with you. Um, I did a, a presentation a few days ago, and I'm going to use a, a bit of that this evening because I think it... Uh, I think it, Jermaine, I think it'll work. And I'm going to start off by talking about uh, character, uh, which is what my grandfather was known for. Uh, and I, the first thing I think of is his parents, John and Martha Ellen Truman. These were simple folks, um, farmers, uh, livestock traders. They were uh, mostly Scots-Irish background, uh, came over from Kentucky. And uh, John and Martha Ellen were straightforward people. And as grandpa himself often said, honor was the first thing with his mother and father. His mother had been to college. She'd had a college education. His father, father quit school early on and went to work. He had always worked for himself. He had hardly ever worked for wages in his life. Um, but they were, honor was so important to my great grandmother, Martha Ellen, Maddie Truman that she enrolled grandpa in the Sunday school at First Presbyterian Church in Independence, Missouri, even though everybody in the family was a Baptist. It, it, was, a, it was a simple matter of, of uh, I won't say convenience, but the Presbyterian Church was only a few blocks from home and the Baptist Church was a lot further away. So I think it was just, she could reliably get grandpa there every Sunday. And he went to Sunday school at First Presbyterian. She, when he was older, and this was in the years when he was in the, when he was in the uh, Jackson County Court, she would send him, my mother remembered that at the end of Sunday dinner, they had Sunday dinner as often as they could together out on the farm in Grandview. And at the end of Sunday dinner, my great grandmother would always send grandpa back to the county court with the admonition, Harry, you be good this to a, you know, a, a 38 year old man, a 38 year old county judge. When he was elected vice president of the United States, she told him to behave himself. So the very strict uh, uh, upbringing that he had as far as, as far as doing the right thing. In fact, she sent him to Washington with the quote from Mark Twain, always do right. You will gratify a few people and astound everybody else. Uh, there was a poem 
not I keep calling it a poem, it was a prayer that my grandfather kept in his wallet all of his life. And, uh, and I'm gonna read it to you now. It's, uh, oh, almighty and everlasting God, creator of heaven, earth, and the universe. Help me to be, to think, to act what is right, because it is right. Make me truthful, honest, and honorable in all things. Make me intellectually honest for the sake of right and honor and without thought of reward to me. Give me the ability to be charitable, forgiving, and patient with my fellow men. Help me to understand their motives and their shortcomings, even as thou understandest mine. Amen, amen, amen carried that with him throughout his life. Um, early on, he, and he had a, uh, his maternal grandfather, Solomon Young, told him early in his life, and I, my grandfather was only a few years old at the time, uh, great-great-grandpa great Young sat him down on his knee one day and said, Harry, if you ever run into a fella who howls too long on Saturday night and prays too loud on Sunday morning, go home and lock your smokehouse. Uh, he he had a uh, he had radar for hypocrites and, and phonies. Grandpa found that out for himself when he was 14 years old. He had uh, his first paying job was at Clinton's drugstore down on the square in Independence. And Grandpa's job was to help Mr. Clinton open. And he went in first thing in the morning, swept the sidewalks, mopped the floors and started on dusting the hundreds and hundreds of medicine bottles that Mr. Clinton kept on shelves all around the store. It was a job that, that Grandpa said he, he never finished before he had to start all over again. There were so many of them. Mr. Clinton, there was a huge case at the back of the store, a medicine case, floor to ceiling case, and it divided the front of the store from the back. And you could walk around it, but you were hidden once you got behind that. And behind that case, Mr. Clinton kept an assortment of whiskey bottles and a little tray. And people would come in, men would come in first thing in the morning, sometimes before Mr. Clinton even got there, come in first thing in the morning and disappear behind that case and get a snort of whiskey and drop a dime in the tray for each snort that they took. And Mr. Clinton had drilled a, a hole in the case so these guys could look out before they left to make sure nobody had seen them go in and duck behind the case. Grandpa noticed right off the bat that the guys coming in first thing in the morning were the people who wanted all the saloons closed. These were the, these were the church goers, these were the deacons. These were the folks who, uh, these were the folks who would, would scream the loudest about sin and here they were sneaking in for a snort first thing in the morning. So he, he learned early on uh, about hypocrites. Um, and he said, he said that he came to have uh, more respect for the, uh, for the men who drank openly in the saloons down on the square. Um, one of the other things that, you know, in, in thinking about uh, integrity, my grandfather's integrity, uh, years later when he became, when he, when he was a county judge, and that happened after World War I, he and Eddie Jacobson had opened the haberdashery in downtown Kansas City together, having run having run the best, the only, the only functioning, the only profitable canteen, Camp Donovan during basic training in Oklahoma. After they both came home from the war, they translated that into business. And that haberdashery did very well the first year. They made the equivalent of, of nearly three quarters of a million dollars on that little store that first year. But the post-war recession hit them and they had to close up shop. Um, and just, uh, just as an aside, uh, and I think it's important, Grandpa and Eddie Jacobson, neither one of them wanted to declare bankruptcy. They could have easily, but both of them wanted all of their creditors to get every penny that they were owed. And Eddie, Eddie stuck it out for about two years before he had to declare bankruptcy. He did not have the resources that, that Grandpa had, having taken a job, eventually having won election as the Eastern Judge of Jackson County, he had better financial resources than Eddie did. But Grandpa never declared bankruptcy and over the next 10 years or so paid back every one of his creditors uh, rather than rather than uh, hide in the protections. Uh, anyway, he went on, one of the officers that he was in the National Guard with, uh, Jim Pendergast, Jim's uncle Tom Pendergast, as I think all of you know, Tom Pendergast ran the uh, Jackson County Democratic machine. And Jim stopped by the store and 
asked grandpa if he wouldn't be interested in running for county judge. He had told his uncle, and this is in grandpa's words, Jim Pendergast had told his uncle Tom that grandpa would make an ideal candidate because he was an officer in the war whose men hadn't wanted to shoot him. So he tried to talk grandpa into, into running for judge, but at that point, and this would have been in, in 1920, uh, at that point, grandpa and Eddie were doing very well in the store and grandpa didn't think he could give the time up. He, he couldn't divide the time. But of course, a little later when the store had to close, he ran for Eastern judge of Jackson County and won in 1922. He, um, and, and I'll take a little detour here, just chronologically. He ran again in 1924 and lost. It was the only election that, the only election he lost in his career. Um, and part of the reason was that the, the burgeoning, the nascent Ku Klux Klan had lined up against him. The Klan had come to his office uh, during the campaign in 1924. And at this point, the Klan, and Grandpa even said it himself, at this point, the Klan seemed like a fairly harmless patriotic organization. Uh, even Grandpa, it's, it sounds a little naive, but even he didn't really understand what they were about at first. And he had actually considered joining uh, just, as, just as a political expediency. Well, they came to his office and they told him that if he joined, they would support him. But uh, if, if he won, if he won judge, he could not hire blacks, Jews, Catholics, anybody they didn't like. And it was the, the, uh, the ban on Catholics that really got grandpa's back up because he had been the captain of an all Catholic battery, Irish and German Catholics during World War II. And, a wonderful group of men very close to him. And he just, he would not, he drew the line at discrimination. And he told the Klan where to get off. And in short order, they threatened to kill him. Well, grandpa wasn't gonna let that stand. He couldn't let that lie. So he actually went out to a Klan meeting. This was not, uh, I've heard different reports of this. Uh, it, it seems though, my, my mother, uh, my mother and David McCullough, I think both said this was not a nighttime torches burning cross full regalia meeting. This was a daylight meeting. And grandpa went to this meeting in Lee's summit and basically uh, took the podium and told the Klan what he thought of them and marched out. And he said himself, it was a, his timing was good because as on his way out, he ran into an entire carload of his friends armed with baseball bats and shotguns coming to back him up. And of course the Klan had baseball bats and shotguns too. It could have gotten really, really ugly. So he, he stood up to the Klan in 1924, lost the election, was out of office for two years. 1926, he ran for and was elected presiding judge. Jackson County had three judges, Eastern, Western, and presiding judge, and the presiding judge is in for a four year term. And it was at that point that grandpa floated a bond issue to the county to, to rebuild, rebuild the roads, Jackson County roads were in, were in bad shape and to build uh, hospitals, uh, refurbish the courthouse in Kansas City and, and build a, I mean, refurbish the courthouse in Independence and build a courthouse in Kansas City. Uh, Multi-million dollar bound, six and a half, seven million dollars. And when it came to the roads, grandpa had promised the voters that he would accept the low bid and on top of that, that contractor would have to have his work submitted for inspection by a nonpartisan board of engineers. Previously, contractors allied with Pendergast had been getting the road contracts and they had been charging top dollar and doing really shoddy work and pocketing the difference. My mother remembered, uh, she'd take Sunday drives with my grandparents and she remembered that at different places along the line, grandpa would get out and inspect the roads. And when he got on a bad one, she remembered him getting out of the car, walking over the side of the road, stamping down on the edge of it. And the, uh, the, the asphalt crumbled like a pie crust. He ju it just broke right off. They were so thin and so badly made. In fact, they called them pie crust roads. Well, after he, after he got the bond issue passed and it looked like the contracts were not going to Pendergast cronies, Pendergast called grandpa into his office. And in that office were five or six of these road contractors. And Pendergast said, uh, Harry, these fellows wanna know why they're not getting the road contracts this time around. And grandpa said, they can have the road contracts as long as they'll turn in a low bid and have their work inspected. 
And these fellows started grumbling and Pendergast turned to him. He said, see, I told you he's a contrary son of a bitch in the whole state of Missouri. And they all walked out of the office grumbling the whole way. And Pendergast told my grandfather, you know, you do what you promise the voters to do. And he never again asked grandpa to do anything illegal. Political appointments, put my nephew on the payroll. All of that was fine with grandpa, but never anything straightforward, dishonest. And when he got to, uh, when he got to the Senate, and I always like this story, um, he, looked, he read up on everybody that he was going to be working with. He was so awed and so, he had read so much American history and he had so much respect for the institutions in this country that when he got to the Senate and realized that, that his fellow senators were captains of industry, uh, people who had been uh, in Congress for decades, uh, lawyers, people, he was just, he was overawed by what he was walking into and he had actually done research as grandpa always did with everything. He had read up on all these folks and learned who they were and what their points of view were, and how they came to their jobs and what kind of people they were. And so he was, uh, he was very humbled the day he was sworn in. And not long after that, uh, Senator Hamilton Lewis uh, took him aside and said, listen, don't, don't let this get to you. For the first six months, you will wonder how you got here. Ever after that, you'll wonder how the hell the rest of us got here. So he went in, you know, to to a uh, to this body um, with great respect, and also taking the job very very seriously. One of the first things he did, he was he was on the Interstate Commerce uh, Committee, and there's a, he gave a couple of good speeches about that, and I think they're uh, they're definitely they definitely make sense for today. Um, in 1926. Uh, just going back a little bit, the American railroads in this country had almost 2 million people on the payroll and the pay, that payroll was nearly $3 billion. By 1938, so uh, a dozen years later, uh, half of those people were out of work and 10,000 miles of track had been let, let go to ruin, which affected cities, towns, businesses across the nation. The transportation system in this country was being crippled and not crippled by an economic downturn or, or bad luck. This was the work of Wall Street financiers, the, the folks that we call the 1% these days. Um, and here, I'll read to you a bit from a speech uh, in typical Truman fashion that, that, uh, that Grandpa gave about this uh, in 1936. This was two years after he got to the Senate. Uh, the first railroad robbery was committed on the Rock Island line back in 1873, just each of, east of Council Bluff, Iowa. The man who committed that robber used a gun and a horse and got up early in the morning. He and his gang took a chance on being killed and eventually most were. That railroad robber's name was Jesse James. Um, the same Jesse James held up the Missouri Pacific in 1876 and took the paltry sum of $17,000 from the express car. About 30 years after the council bluff hold up, the Rock Island went through a looting by some gentlemen known as the Tin Plate Millionaires. They used no guns, but they ruined the railroad and got away with $70 million or more. They did it by means of holding companies. Senators can see what pikers Mr. James and his crowd were alongside some real artists. So he was already on the lookout for, again, for, for the common man, the working man. And this, uh, uh, he would have enjoyed a, a story. Uh, he had a you know, distrust of big business and bankers. He would have enjoyed a story that uh, Lyndon Johnson told. Uh, and they were friends. Grandpa and Mr. Johnson were friends. Of course, as I think you all know, uh, President Johnson got, um, uh, got health care passed when Grandpa couldn't do it and uh, came, to, came to Independence, Missouri and signed the Medicare Act on stage at the Truman Library and gave my grandparents card one and card two. So that was a, a good friendship, but he would have enjoyed a story that Mr. Johnson uh, uh, told. His daughter, Linda, uh, said that her father Oven told these parables as she called them. And apparently there was a man uh, waiting for a heart transplant and his doctor came to him and said, you're in luck, you got three good candidates. And the man said, who are they? And well, the first one's a high school athlete, just uh, died on the field, his heart's in good shape, high school athlete. Second one's a woman uh, in her early 40s, a good woman. She ran an orphanage. She, she took in foster kids, just a good hearted woman. 
And the third one is a, is a, a banker who died of old age. And the patient said, well, I'll take the banker's heart. And the doctor said, you have a high school athlete or a good woman in her 40s. Why would you choose the heart of an old banker? And the man smiled and said, because I'm pretty sure it hadn't been used. That was an LBJ joke that grandpa would have appreciated, but he, he had a serious problem with, uh, he himself, after, uh, after spending, he spent nearly 12 years on the farm, his, before World War I, his, his father ran into a spate of bad luck, uh, lost all of his savings in, in uh, uh, speculating on grain futures, and then not long after that, uh, lost 80 acres of corn to a flood and um, called grandpa home. They retreated to the, to the young farm in Grandview, Missouri, uh, my uh, great-grandmother's farm. Retreated up there and John Truman called my grandfather and his brother Vivian home to help run. It was the 600 acre farm. And I think they, they leased all together. At some points they had leased another thousand acres. So they had a, or at least another 400 acres. So they had a thousand acres they had to manage. Um, Anyway, he spent 11 years on the farm and a lot of that they lost their profit to lawsuits because the farm was left to uh, Maddie, my great, great grandmother and uh, my great grandmother and um, her brother Harrison, her youngest brother Harrison and the other six kids got five bucks each. And they got that because none of them ever showed any interest in the farm um, at all. And when the will came to be read, when Harriet uh, Young read the will, when, her, when she died in 1909, she left them all that five bucks and they sued. And they tied up uh, any profit that my uh, great grandfather and grandfather made were tied up in, in lawsuits with lawyers for a number of years. Anyway, when all of that resolved, uh, grandpa invested in a lead and zinc mine, which went bust. And after that, he invested in oil leases in Kansas and Oklahoma. And he sold those leases at the start of World War I and they made a little money or, or broke even. Um, but I, the, the, uh, the pain of it was for grandpa that one of the leases that he sold to a, a new investor drilled a little deeper and hit the teeter pool, hit oil, hit the biggest oil reserve under the plains. And grandpa said that I often wondered what my life would have been like had I done that. But he added that he never wanted to be, and he called it a bloated plutocrat. He never wanted to be that kind of guy. He said, I just, you know, I'd like enough to clear all my debts and to have something left over. He didn't want to be, he didn't want to be hugely rich. He just wanted to be comfortable and uh, wanted, <laughs> just wanted to have any debt. Um, he and, uh, you know, he had a number of jobs uh, growing up. He started off that first job at Clinton's drugstore when he was 14. His first job out of high school was on a railroad gang, keeping time, getting the men paid, lived in the tent camps with the itinerant workers, the hobo as he called them, uh, lived with them. Uh, after that, he worked for the Kansas City Star in the mailroom for a little while. He's sorting mail for the Kansas City Star and clerked in two banks before, uh, <coughs> before John Truman called him home to work the farm. And then of course, after that, um, he re-upped for the Missouri National Guard to, uh, to train and fight in uh, World War I. And that brings up something else, I think, about character, about leadership. The, uh, the infamous Battery D, which, and I've read a lot of different stories. Growing up, I used to think they were a bunch of maniacs and hooligans, uh, the way people talked about them. They were educated Kansas City Irish Catholics, most of them. There was, as I said, there were a few uh, Germans among the uh, among the group, but they they were educated guys. They just had a very healthy disregard for authority, and I believe they had been through. I've heard different accounts, but anywhere between two and four captains you know, had run through before Grandpa got a hold of him, and they were all set to give him the same treatment because. Uh, to them, he did not look very imposing. He was 5'9", wearing spectacles. He, he seemed prim and proper to them. And he went up in front of them uh, the first, first time he had them all on, on the parade ground. Uh, they, they gave him a Bronx cheer. They blew a raspberry at him. 
And that night, some of the non-commissioned officers got together and got drunk and stampeded some of the horses through the camp. Well, the next morning they looked up at the board and found that all of them had been demoted to private with a corresponding reduction in pay. They had all lost their sergeants and corporals pay. And they straightened up in short order after that. But grandpa just didn't, he wasn't gonna take any crap from them, but that wasn't, that's only part of it. He also took a serious interest in their lives. He, he knew them, he knew them, he knew their families, he knew their backgrounds, he asked them, he talked to them. And when it came to being on the line, he was up there with them. He was shoulder to shoulder with his men. He wasn't sitting on a horse half a mile back. He was up on the firing line with his men. And the only time, and I'm sure that, that you all have heard this, this story, <coughs> excuse me, the only time that they had uh, any, any trouble on the battlefield, it was the first engagement. They unloaded uh, the shells at the Germans which of course told the Germans exactly where they were and the Germans turned around and fired back and shells started landing around them and some of the men got spooked and took off. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it is not COVID, it's just a dry throat. Um, some of the men took off, ran for the rear and grandpa was luckily able to get uh, the rest of the horses and the guns out of there. They had to leave two guns behind. They, they covered them up with branches and left them. Uh, thinking they'd come back for him later. And under fire, they got out of there. And of course, he busted the, the folks, the guys who ran, he busted down to private again. Um, and ever after that, though, they called that the Battle of Who Run. So he was, and, and those men, those men not only, not only did the, the members of Battery D march with him in, his inaug in the inaugural parade in 1948, um, there were, the, as, as time went on, uh, there were quite a few of them at his funeral in 1972. And when my grandmother died in 1982, there were still members of Battery D alive that went to her funeral. They stayed close uh, for the rest of their lives. So again, leadership, um, always do the right thing. Uh, you know, it was years ago as a, uh, you know, and I began to work for the Truman Library and you begin to wonder, you know, you've got a famous grandfather, where do you, where do you fit into all of this? Uh, you know, I never wanted to be a politician, but I always thought that, that he gave me a good template for just being a decent human being if I could live up to it. Um, my parents kind of expected that. I, uh, they did not tell me that my grandfather had been president of the United States. I found out in school and I thank God it was first grade and not fourth or fifth. I found out in school, I went to school one morning and the teacher was going around, I think, asking everybody for a little information about themselves. And I just gave my name and she said, wasn't your grandfather president of the United States? And I said, I don't know. I, news to me, I'll go home and ask. And I went home that afternoon and my mother loved telling this story for years. I went home that afternoon, I dropped my book bag at the front door and I marched across the living room and I put my hands on my hips and I said, mom, did you know that Grandpa Truman had been president? And my mother looked at me and said, yes, but just remember something, any little boy's grandfather can be president. Don't let it go to your head. You know, it, it didn't go to my head. It went right over my head. I had no idea what that meant. I was six years old. Um, grandpa was grandpa and but you know a, a, a grandpa that uh, it was an unusual grandfather and I John's heard this story before I think and probably Aaron too <laughs> probably they probably heard it two or three times each um, reading education was very important to uh, to grandpa um, and important to his parents and here I'm just looking for this this little bit here that I had written down. He, uh, he had really bad eyesight. And uh, I've always been telling the story that, that he, uh, uh, you know, my great grandparents took him to a 4th of July celebration when he was six years old. And at the end of the evening when the fireworks were going off over here, grandpa's looking over here somewhere. But really my, uh, my great grandmother, Maddie Truman, taught him to read before he was five years old, before, you know, while he was in kindergarten but she was not using newspapers. And when, when she encouraged him to read the newspapers, he had a lot of trouble with the, the fine print, the newsprint. 
So they took him to the eye doctor and he was diagnosed as having flat eyeballs. Um, he was very farsighted and he wore those thick glasses the rest of his life. It slowed him down in the schoolyard, but it, it opened up the entire world to him at the tips of his fingers. And my great grandmother encouraged serious reading. She didn't give him comic books. The, the earliest present he remembered getting from her was a four volume set called Great Men and Famous Women. Uh, each, each of those books is a doorstop. And he was nine at the time. I was reading Archie when I was nine years old. So he read like that the rest of his life. If I've ever wanted to find grandpa, you go in the den, you go into the study and that's where you'll find him sitting and reading. Um, he said that by the time, by his own admission written in his, uh, in his memoir, by the time he was 14 or 15 years old, he had read every book in the Independence Public Library, including the encyclopedias. And he had read the big old family Bible three times through. So he, he, read, um, he read history. Uh, mostly, he loved history, loved biography. He read history of all the uh, of ancient history, the conquerors, the great nations. He uh, serious bent toward U.S. history. He often said that he thought that if he, even as a child, he understood that if, if he could understand how governments came into being and how they ran, it would be an invaluable education, which turned out to be true. Uh, they had great teachers in independence in, in those days, too. Grandpa said that uh, they gave us our high ideals and they hardly ever got paid any more than $40 a month for it. So teachers then, teachers now, same thing. Uh, his favorite was a teacher named Matilda Brown, Tilly Brown. And there's a fun story about that. At uh, high school graduation in 1901, Charlie Ross, who became grandpa's press secretary, Charlie was the valedictorian. And after the ceremony, Miss Brown gave Charlie a kiss. And grandpa was standing right there and he said, don't I get a kiss too? And she said, you'll get a kiss when you do something important. Well. 30 years later, more than 30 years later, 44 years later, Grandpa and Charlie are sitting in the Oval Office one afternoon by themselves, and they decided to call Miss Brown. <laughs> and they called her up, and, and she answered the phone, and Grandpa said, Miss Brown, this is the President of the United States. Do I get that kiss now? And she said, yes, but you're going to have to come out here to get it. So they had great teachers um, and, and, he, and he read lifelong, as I said, read lifelong. When I was little, uh, grandpa came to visit us in New York and uh, he stayed down the street at the Carlisle Hotel, which was just a, a block away. And he got up every morning at 5.30. Uh, John Truman, his father, was always up. Grandpa hated it when he worked on the farm because because he's Papa. He said was always God. He couldn't believe he did. He always get up when it was pitch dark outside to start the day, wake everybody else up. But it stuck with Grandpa. So he was up at five or five thirty every morning, and he went for a one mile walk, one or two mile walk at a military pace, one hundred and twenty steps a minute. And he came back to the hotel and he ate some breakfast. And then he grabbed as many newspapers as he could get his hands on and walked them up the block and let himself into our apartment and threw the newspapers on the floor and read until somebody else woke up. You know, my mother at, at that time was, was pursuing a television, radio, and theater career. She wasn't up in the morning first thing. But my brother and I were, my younger brother William and I came downstairs one morning and grandpa was reading the New York Times. He couldn't see us. He was behind the newspaper, sitting in a chair in the living room. We knew who it was, so we started to sneak past him or try to sneak past him, get into the den where they kept the television set. And he caught us, he turned the page and caught us, and he said, where do you think you're going? And I said, into the den, you know, watch TV. And he said, you don't wanna do that. <laughs> and I'm sure I thought, yes, I do. God, I wish I hadn't gotten caught. <coughs> and he said, I have a much better idea. And he walked past us into the den. He took a book off the top shelf and he came back out and he said, you two come down here, come over here and sit down next to me. Well, we didn't argue with him. So we sat down and he opened the book and started to read. And I don't know how long it was, 15, 20 minutes. My mother realized we weren't in our beds and she staggered down the stairs and she stopped on the bottom step and just stared into the living room. She'd never seen anything like this. 
we were sitting on either side of grandpa, not making a sound, not moving a muscle while he read to us from a book that didn't have any pictures in it. She said, what are you reading to them? It turned out to be Thucydides, history of the Peloponnesian War at six o'clock in the morning to a four-year-old and a two-year-old. So he thought, you know, reading was important to him. And he thought, I guess by age four, I was behind in my Thucydides, thought I should get started. Uh, he also, the story that goes with that happened either on that, I think it was on that same visit. Uh, he, he didn't expect any fuss from anybody. Grandpa got knocked down often in his life. Uh, you know, the, uh, the farm, he had trouble with the farm. The, the lead and zinc mine failed. The oil well didn't produce until somebody else bought it. Um, he worked in the, in the Crooked Pendergast administration. He had, he had setbacks and defeats, uh, but he never stopped. He never, he never complained. He never whined, uh, never poor me. He just picked himself up and got moving again and he expected the same thing from his family. I had one of those uh, hobby horses, uh, thick plastic, uh, sat on a, on a wooden uh, frame with springs at the knees and the front and the back. And you bounce up and down on that thing, side to side. And my mother, all, I, apparently I rode it hard. And she always had, to, she was always telling me, stop it, stop, you're gonna hurt yourself, don't do that. Well, one morning she wasn't around. It was just me and grandpa in the, in the dining room where we kept that horse. And he was back behind the newspaper. He was a terrible babysitter. He was paying no attention to me at all. And I rode the horse hard and sure enough, I. I landed funny and tipped it over and crashed. And my grandmother was in the kitchen making breakfast and she came running out and she saw me sprawl across the floor with this hobby horse on top of me and she went to pick me up. And of course, I here she comes and you see your grandmother coming, you burst into tears. She's, you're gonna get a hug or a cookie or something. So she, uh, she came to scoop me up and a voice from across the room said, stop right there, don't you touch him. And she did, she stopped cold. And I looked up to see who was ruining this for me. And grandpa was glaring at me over the top of the newspaper. And he said, you, you're not hurt. Quit crying. I shut up immediately. He said, get that contraption back up, get on it and start riding it again. I, I couldn't move fast enough. We got the horse up. My grandmother put me on it, brushed me off, went back in the kitchen. And I rode very carefully for about another 30 seconds until I figured it was safe to get the hell out of there. Turned out he was much nicer to uh, much nicer to me than he than his own father than John Truman was to him. Um, grandpa was riding a John Truman bought my grandfather a pony when he was very young when they were still living outside of Independence. Uh, I think he was four or five years old. And John got him a saddle and, and a pony and all of that. And Grandpa wasn't paying attention one day and he fell off, fell out of the saddle, and and John said, look, any boy can't stay in a, on, a, on a pony that's walking, deserves to walk himself and made him walk back to the house. So at least he was, at least he was nicer to me than, than John was to him. Um, but as I say, it's, you know, he's, I think in, uh, given what we've all been through in the last four years and what we've been through more recently, it, it's good to remember that kind of character in a president, um, somebody who uh, does right for the sake of doing right and nothing else, and um, and and somebody who who always has uh, other people's interests, always treats people well, and has their interests at heart when he's in power. Uh, there's a story that uh, a couple of stories I'll leave you with before questions. Um, Grandpa always said that the the Korean War was the hardest set of decisions, hardest decision he had to make to send young men back into war and a different kind of war than we had been fighting in World War I or World War II. Um, you know, fighting a contained war, fighting a, a, a police action, as they called it. Uh, it was important, but it was, it, was, uh, it was a hard sell. It was a hard thing to explain. After he left office in 1953, he received at his office at the Truman Library a letter from a Mr. William Banning of Connecticut. Mr. Banning's son, George, had been killed in Korea uh, near the end of the fighting. And the letter in the envelope Mr. Banning Sr. had enclosed uh, George Banning's Purple Heart. 
And with it uh, was the following note uh, written in all caps. Uh, Mr. Truman, as you have been directly responsible for the loss of our son's life in Korea, you might just as well keep this emblem on display in your trophy room as a memory of one of your historic deeds. Our major regret at this time is that your daughter was not there to receive the same treatment as our son received in Korea. Uh, after grandpa died, the Truman Library staff went to inventory what, the things that were in his working office in the Truman Library. And they found that medal in a drawer close by, that medal in that note. Grandpa kept it close at hand for the rest of his life to remind him what it meant uh, to make those decisions, uh, to remind him of the consequences of his actions, no matter how noble they were, uh, to remember that people paid for those decisions. And just in the end, we, you know, we were talking, um, talking about uh, uh, some weeks ago, talk, yelling, talking or yelling about the orderly transfer of power in this country. Um, grandpa was the, uh, Grandpa was the reason we have the modern transfer of power, the, the, the actual steps that presidents now go through or are supposed to go through uh, in transferring power from one administration to another. Uh, when he left office in uh, early 1953, and this would have been after Ike was elected in, in November of 52, Grandpa sent him a telegram saying, come on over. Uh, uh, he, you know, bring your staff, bring your, your cabinet. I want everybody to have free access to the West Wing and the Oval Office. I want you to know exactly what everybody's doing. Uh, he knew they were going to make changes, but he wanted them to hit the ground running. He wanted them to have that continuity. And he said, he put it this way, he said that, um, so that it may be clear to all the world that this nation is united in its struggle for freedom and peace. Uh, this, these, these set of steps were, uh, put into law with the Transition Act of 1963. So this was, it was another 10 years before they, you know, before this was codified. But this is what grandpa did was, was he started this, uh, the orderly transfer of power as we know it today. Uh, and he also, he, he mentioned some other presidents. He said, you know, it's mostly been orderly over the years, but of course, John and Abigail Adams snuck out in the middle of the night because Adams didn't like Thomas Jefferson, didn't want to have to deal with him, so he left. Um, his uh, John Quincy Adams didn't stick around because he had waged such a vicious campaign against uh, Grandpa's hero Andrew Jackson that Mrs. Jackson, who was a very sensitive woman, actually died from the stress of the campaign, and so Jackson's supporters were so angry they packed Washington. So uh, Adams and and his guys took off. Turned out ultimately, as Grandpa said, that. Uh, Jackson's supporters were actually more of a threat to him. So many of them packed into the White House that he was afraid he might be crushed and he ducked out the back, get away from them. Um, but so he, Grandpa started the, the modern orderly transition of power. And, and remember that at the time, Grandpa and Eisenhower were not getting along. They barely spoke on the ride from the White House to the Capitol, but they, they still did it. I mean, they were very, very angry at each other. They patched it all up years later, but at the time they were, they were, not, they were barely speaking. And I'll leave you with this uh, on leaving power, uh, leaving the White House. Uh, one of grandpa's earliest heroes was Cincinnatus uh, who had been called upon. He was retired, a military man called, he'd gone back to his farm and uh, he was called back by the Roman Senate to rescue the Roman legions. And he did such a good job they gave him dictatorial powers to, to fix the situation. And he did, and he did so well that the Senate said, keep them, keep the dictatorial powers. We like the way, you, we like the way you're running the show. And Cincinnati said, no, you gave me the powers for a reason, for a specific reason. I've done the job that I was supposed to do. Here, take them back. I'm going back to my farm. So, and that's the way grandpa viewed the presidency. It was a set of powers, a set of tools. You use them to your best ability and then you put them away. Um, you put them away and you go back to the number one job in this country, as Grandpa always said, was not President of the United States, but American citizen, because after all, the President and our elected officials work for us. And I'll leave you with what uh, Benjamin Franklin said about that. Grandpa quoted him. Uh, in a free society, the rulers are the servants and the people are their superiors and sovereigns.
There we go. Questions? Thank you, John. I can see you clapping. <laughs> Okay, good, my microphone's on. Thanks, Chris. Jeff, tell the story about uh, being in Washington, D.C. and trying to miss the train. I love that story. Oh, the Johnson story, <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we went to, uh, my grandparents have been invited to President Johnson's inauguration and they were 81 and 80 that year. And they just, they didn't feel like making the trip. And they sent my mother instead. And my mother took my father and me and my brother, Will. And uh, we stayed at Blair House across the street. My mother was the, uh, uh, the hostess at one of the inaugural balls. And the next morning, uh, we all went over to the White House to have breakfast with the Johnsons before we got on a train and went back to New York. And we got over there and we're, we're all, dressed to the nines and and you know my mother had been running combs through our hair and yelling at us to hurry up and get ready and of course we got up on the second floor of the white house and the johnsons were still in their pajamas they weren't getting up and doing all that and we sat down and had breakfast with them and at some point my father looked at his watch and said you know we really need to be going we got a, a 10 o'clock train uh, back to new york and president johnson said oh cliff relax the train will wait and my father said, yeah, for you, you're the president of the United States, not gonna wait for me. And the president said, oh, sit down, sit down, you got time. So dad did, <coughs> and he let time get away from him. And he looked at his watch again, he bolted to his feet and he said, we really gotta get out of here now. And so we ran out of the White House, jumped into the car they had waiting for us. Uh, it was already after 10 o'clock, we'd missed the train. And you know, my parents started the argument in the car what do we do now? You want to fly? No. Well, when's the next train? This afternoon. And, and so they're arguing back and forth. And nobody noticed immediately that the, the driver had not taken us to the front of the station like everybody else. He had pulled into the back and pulled onto a train platform. And there was a train and there was a guy with a baggage cart and a conductor with his watch out. And we started running for the train. And the conductor said, folks, slow down, slow down. You got time. The White House called. President Johnson had stopped the train. Uh, and of course that's, you know, my father had one reaction, which was, why didn't he tell me he was gonna do that? I wouldn't have run all the way, you know. <laughs> and my reaction as a seven year old was, wow, my grandfather could stop trains. Clifton, we do have some questions coming in. Okay. Um, Mike Smith would like to know more about the buck stops here. <laughs> Okay. Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, Buck Stops Here sign on Grandpa's desk was a, a gift from um, Fred Canfil, C-A-N-F-I-L. Fred, Fred had worked with, with and for my grandfather since, uh, since the days of the court, Jackson County Court. Um, and uh, Fred, at the, at the time when Grandpa was in office, Fred had become, I don't know if he was a U.S. Marshal by then. I think so, because as a matter of fact, he, he must have been because uh, Grandpa took Fred to Potsdam with him to meet Stalin and Churchill. And Grandpa gleefully introduced Fred to the Russians as Marshal Canfield, and they all thought he was a field marshal and treated him with great respect for the rest of the trip. Uh, anyway, uh, Fred was uh, visiting the commandant, uh, the warden of, uh, I think it was, I wanna say, I can't remember which prison it was, I'm sorry, but it was one of the prison workshops and they were making those signs, uh, uh, the buck stops here. And Fred saw that and, and, and said, that's, that's Harry Truman. And he, bought, he grabbed it for him and gave it to him as a gift. So it originally, and I don't, I, I wanna say it was from Leavenworth, but I don't think that's, I'm not sure that's right. But the, of course, this, and I don't know, I think grandpa's, I don't know if grandpa's sign said it too, but the, the signs that they sell at the gift shop and the one I have on my desk says, um, buck stops here on one side and I'm from Missouri on the other side. So. Hmm. Um, somebody named David says, do you have some info on your grandfather's Masonic history? Um, hi, David, I don't, I don't have a lot, you'd think, 
you think I would know more, um, but I, I have to rely on the uh, Missouri Lodge of Research for, for all of that. I know that Grandpa wanted to join the Masons. He was, uh, I think it was in, let's say it was, he went to the farm in 1906, and I think it was 1908 that, um, and I, I think he's still unnamed, a, a Mason came to the farm, he's wearing a, he's wearing a pin, and Grandpa recognized it and, and asked him, uh, how do I, how can I join? Can I get, you know, membership application? And that's how it started. Um, my favorite story, of course, is that, uh, well, two, the, the, the short one that I always liked was that at one point, and I, I need to find out someday when this was, he was asked to write down his accomplishments and he put uh, Grand Master above President of the United States <laughs> in that order. So he... Uh, uh, that one, and I always liked the one when he was uh, on the campaign train uh, going through Indiana in 1948, and one of his, uh, uh, a young man who had been a corpsman, a Navy corpsman on the presidential yacht, was being raised at a lodge nearby, and Grandpa uh, ducked out of his hotel that evening with just a, a couple of, a couple or three Secret Service agents, and went to the lodge and took part in the ceremony, the young man's raising ceremony, and of course, the funny part about that is, is that the grandpa's going into the lodge and, and the secret service started to follow him. And he said, wait a minute, are you fellows masons? And they said, no. And he said, well, you can't come in. And they said, well, we're the secret service. And grandpa said, I don't care. You're not a mason. You can't, you can't come in. And they went back and forth and back and forth. And grandpa finally said, look, I'm safer in there with those guys than I would be out here. Don't worry about it. It's fine. And I just have this great image of, um, of you know, heavily armed Secret Service agents on one side and the Tyler with a sword, just you know, <laughs> not not letting them by. But he, he, he obviously he held masonry in very very high regard. Wayne Fryer would like you to discuss your grandfather's relationship with FDR. That was uh, that was a complicated relationship. Um, Grandpa was a New Deal Democrat. He, he, uh, he had the highest respect for President Roosevelt. He had a, um, they had a, uh, I wouldn't call it a falling out, but there was a problem on the way, on the way to his becoming vice president. When he ran, he was elected to the Senate in 1934. And when he ran again in 1940, he was opposed by the governor of Missouri named Lloyd Stark at the time. And Stark, the Stark family, I think it was Stark family, Stark Orchard, Stark was a, a millionaire uh, apple grower, essentially, had gotten the, the governorship. And Grandpa and Tom Pendergast had helped Stark attain the governorship. And Stark had said up one side and down the other that he would never, you know, he wasn't interested in running against Grandpa, and then turned around and did, and started cozying up to Roosevelt as a way to edge Grandpa out. And um, it's, it, seemed to be working for a while. Grandpa was hurt by that. I mean, he understood politics, but he was hurt by the fact that Roosevelt could have his head turned uh, by flattery, essentially. Stark was just flattering Roosevelt. It, it turned out not to work. Roosevelt figured out after a time that Stark was, you know, basically all flattery and nothing else and backed away from supporting him. And uh, Grandpa wound up winning the election by the slimmest of margins. Um, and of course, uh, went on to be Roosevelt's vice president. Roosevelt did not share much if, uh, or if anything at all with him. In those days, vice presidents weren't very well informed. Anyway, Grandpa always made the joke that about the, uh, the woman who had two sons. One, one was a sea captain and one became vice president of the United States and neither one of them was ever heard from again. <laughs> so he, uh, he, but he, um, he, Roosevelt didn't didn't tell him much, and so he really had to. When Roosevelt died, he had to hit the ground running. Uh, he had to do a lot of catch up. Uh, but again, he he was a New Deal Democrat, and he had great respect for Roosevelt. I years ago, when I first met, I think it was in 2015, I first met David Roosevelt, FDR's grandson, and we were doing a a program with Mary Jean Eisenhower, and the three of us were talking about our grandfather's relationships with each other, which were complicated. And uh, I joked to David at one point, I said, you know, your grandfather didn't tell my grandfather a damn thing. And we all went to bed and the next morning, David came down to breakfast in the hotel and I said, good morning, David, how are you? And he said, I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> um, K 
Karen B says, your mother's book, Harry S. Truman, is my favorite book on your grandfather. What book oh. on your grandfather is your favorite? Karen, that would be my favorite book too. Uh, but that's, uh, that's family obligation right there. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of have to say that, don't you? Yeah, you kind of have to say that. Anytime anybody asks me, what's the best book on your grandfather? Moms. <laughs> uh, it is a good book. And it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's fun because it's told from a daughter's perspective. So it's not, um, you know, it's well written. And it's, um, it's, it's very human. I even, and, and the, I even enjoyed uh, the one that she wrote on my grandmother even more because I hadn't, heard a lot of that growing up so this uh, and this was you know I read it 30 years ago but it, uh, that's also a good book but beyond um, uh, beyond my mother's books and I'm looking at them I've got my phone on a stack of, of books about my grandfather here so I can just read them um, David McCullough's book is very good the 1993 Pulitzer Prize winner and Bob Farrell uh, University of Indiana wrote a dozen books or more, I want to say, on Grandpa, various aspects of the Truman presidency. His are good, too. And most recently, um, A.J. Bame wrote a book a couple of years ago, The Accidental President, which chronicles the first three months of Grandpa's presidency after Roosevelt's death. And he's just recently won. And I, and I want to say the new book is it's about the 1948 campaign. And I can't remember. If, I think it's Truman Defeats Dewey. I think he turned it the right way around for the title of the book. But AJ's uh, got a good, and Joe Scarborough just recently uh, wrote a book on on Grandpa and the uh, the uh, what he did to secure Europe after World War II. That's a good book. Yeah. Uh, Mike Dodd has an observation. He says, "24 years this morning, my father Robert Dodd passed away. He worked for a Railway Express Agency in Independence in the 50s, driving a delivery truck from the depot." He always told the story of delivering a case of whiting fish every Thursday to the Trumans. And on arrival, Bess would always fuss and say, I sure wish Harry would quit ordering these things as I am tired of all this fish. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask about whiting fish. Is that what he said? Whiting fish, yeah. Whiting fish. Uh, that's a good story. I. Uh, I had no idea that, that grandpa was ordering whiting fish. You know, I, I guess, you know, he, he gets, gets where he likes something, just latches on and keeps ordering it. Uh, my grandmother uh, had a great sense of humor. Um, she, uh, a couple of the stories that I always liked, uh, somebody suggested that, uh, and this was a story I heard years ago, suggested that she didn't, she didn't like bourbon as much as grandpa did, but that's not true. Um, First, I think the first formal evening in the White House, uh, she asked for an old fashioned and the, uh, the butler head usher made her one. I think it was Mr. Fields. I think it was Alonzo Fields made her a, an old fashioned and she drank it, but she apparently didn't like it. She sent word down the next day that, you know, try something else. And so that evening he tried a different recipe. She took one sip and handed it back and he tried a third recipe and she again took a sip and handed it back and said, that's still not it. And now he's frustrated. So he just went in there, he, he dropped a bunch of uh, ice cubes into a glass, poured straight bourbon over him and handed it back to her. And she took a sip and went, oh, now that's an old fashioned. <laughs> so uh, that was one. And the other one, somebody asked her once, you know, Mrs. Truman, uh, is it true that you, uh, that you tenderize your Thanksgiving turkey by pouring bourbon down its throat? And my grandmother said, no, we pour the bourbon down the throats of our guests and they just think the turkey's tender. <laughs> But I like the whiting story. I'll have to look into that. Uh, Charlie wants to know, did your grandpa ever say he talked about masonry with FDR? Uh, hi, Charlie. No, no. That, and that's the first time that's come up. Yeah, I, both, I don't know that Mason, they, so. he only met with FDR twice. And those, both those meetings were largely ceremonial. You know, you've seen, I'm sure, Charlie, you've seen the, um, the, the, the famous photograph of Grandpa and FDR both in their shirt sleeves on the, on the White House lawn having coffee. Um, but there was not, like I said, he did not, Roosevelt did not tell my grandfather a whole lot, did not tell anybody a whole lot. Roosevelt uh, liked to play his cards close to the chest. He, he did not give anybody more information than, than they needed. He liked to run, he liked to hold all the strings. It was just the way he governed, it's the way he ran things. One of my favorite uh, things on, you know, we've mentioned your, your grandfather's Masonic career. 
um, in one of his letters to your grandmother. And I think, I, I think this was in the book, uh, Brother Truman, that came out. Um, I, think, I think your grandpa was still alive when this came out, but um, it mentions one of the letters and in one of the letters, because your grandfather was, was not only very active in the administration of lodges and such, he was a very good ritualist and was well yeah. known in the whole Kansas City area for his ritual. And um, they, were, they were talking about, he, he mentions in his letter that people were talking about that he has a future someday as possibly the grand lecturer of the state or the grand master. Yeah. And he says in the letter to your grandmother, he says, I don't have to tell you which I would prefer, which is yeah. kind of an enigmatic statement because we don't know. <laughs> Yeah, we don't know <laughs> what he actually preferred, but we know where he ended up. So, yeah, he was, you know, in Lodge. I always think of my grandfather in Lodge, you know, when we're when we're hemming and hawing and trying to remember the, the direction of the words. And I'm like, oh, God, he, you know, he strangled his grandson. <laughs> yep. I think that's all the questions. There's several comments okay. on how much they enjoyed this presentation, everybody is very positive about it. Well, uh, good. I Rick enjoyed Thompson it. Too. Would like to know, in your opinion, what was the most difficult decision President Truman had to make? Uh, and again, he said, uh, Grandpa always said it was Korea. Um, you know, it was, and I think because, again, it was five years after a world war, a ruinous world war, and um, fighting, you know, again, fighting for a, a, uh, a friend, uh, you know, fight, you know, fighting again, this is very hard to, to, uh, and I keep using advertising terms, hard to sell that hard to explain that to people that, that it's important to, to stop the spread of communism, that it's important to defend your friends. You know, you've promised to, to, uh, defend South Korea. And it wasn't just South Korea, it was, you know, if South Korea falls then others start falling and you've got a domino effect. Um, and we're talking about Joe Scarborough's book. Um, Korea seemed to come a little bit out of left field because we were, we were looking at Europe. The Soviet Union was, Stalin was going back on all of his agreements. He was uh, padding his border with smaller countries and gobbling up anybody that was weak. And of course, grandpa, instituted what we know as the Truman Doctrine, aid to Greece and Turkey to keep both those countries from falling to the two uh, puppet governments, puppet Soviet governments. Um, and um, then you had the NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, to be, which Grandpa likened to a group of homeowners with similar interests. You know, it's it's in, within our interest to band together. And the Marshall Plan, uh, rebuilding, uh, financially rebuilding infrastructure, agriculture, you strengthen a country and make people's lives better, there's less of a chance they're gonna be taken over. Uh, less of a, they, they're not weak. And the last one was point four, which was the United States exporting technology, all the stuff that we'd learned, all the leaps we'd made, we were sharing. So uh, creating a stable democratic link to Europe, which acted as a, not only acted as a bulwark against the Soviet Union, but also just generally made life better for people on a grand scale. Um, so we're, but we're looking at that side of the Soviet Union, not, not Korea. Um, and grandpa was home for that. Yeah. You know, he was having dinner when they got the call that the North had invaded the South. Um, and that's, I keep forgetting that's still, that's uh, that's still a war. We're just in a ceasefire that's lasted since 1953. Joe Russell would like to know if you could update us on the library upgrade. Sort of. <laughs> um, the library upgrade, we, we uh, lucked out as in terms of, of pandemic and the library upgrade because we had raised the money we needed and the work had started when, when everybody had to shelter and workmen uh, could go in wearing masks and, and work in isolation. So it's pretty much complete. I don't know when we're gonna be able to reopen when people will be able to go and see the library. I took a tour of it, Polly and I took a tour of it in uh, October when we went down for the annual fundraiser. The, uh, the Wild About Harry fundraiser, which is usually in April, of course, 
you know, thousand people were not gathering in a ballroom in April. So we put it off till October and did it mostly remotely from, from the, uh, from the same, from the uh, Mulebach Hotel, the Marriott downtown, uh, Kansas City, uh, but, but did it pretty much like we're doing this. We had a, a glorified Zoom meeting, um, which, which worked well enough. But that afternoon before that, Polly and I and A.J. Bame and uh, General Jim Mattis was our uh, Truman Award uh, winner took a tour of the library and it wasn't quite finished, but you can get an idea. It's a lot more, um, it's a lot more technology involved. Uh, the, the flow has been reversed because it used to be you parked in the back and then you'd have to walk around the front of the building to start in the correct way. I don't know why they built it that way in 1957, but they did. So now there's a beautiful uh, two-story atrium off the parking lot and back. So you could park the lot, go in the gift shops right there if if your children refuse to go any further and they just want a toy, they can go in there. So my kids always did every museum I ever took them to. Um, and you then that that the flow has been reversed. So you start at the back and, and work your way through the exhibits. But a lot of it, it looks really good. I couldn't you know, I don't know all of it yet because they were still putting plaster and stringing lights and and adding some wires. But it, it's going to be really nice. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah. Uh, Bruce Dalton would like to know, he had heard President Roosevelt coerced your grandfather into being nominated as vice president by threatening to select Henry Wallace if Harry would not take the job. Can Hi, you... Bruce. Uh, uh, no, sort of. Uh, uh, they, Grandpa was in because they did not want Wallace, um, Roosevelt and the Democratic leadership. Mr. Wallace was a very accomplished, very smart, kind of cool guy, but he was just way liberal, even for uh, the Democratic leadership. Um, and, and it was felt that he was just a little bit too open to the Soviet Union, a little bit too friendly uh, to the idea of communism. I don't know how, uh, how true that was, but what Roosevelt did do, Grandpa resisted several times becoming vice president because he, he just didn't want the job. He loved the Senate. Those were, by his own uh, admission, those were the best 10 years of his career was, was in the Senate. Uh, he liked the communality, he liked the give and take, all of that. Uh, and finally, in here in Chicago during the convention, he was refusing and refusing and Bob Hannigan, uh, chairman of the Democratic Party called Roosevelt and told him that Grandpa was still hemming and hawing, and Roosevelt told Hannigan to hold out the phone, and Hannigan held it out like this so Grandpa could hear it. And Roosevelt said, "Tell him if he wants to wreck the Democratic Party in the middle of a war, go ahead and don't run." And at that point, David McCullough uh, reported that at that point Grandpa said, "Shit," and acquiesced. So it, what Roosevelt did bully him into it, but not by threatening him with Henry Wallace. Oh, I think that's, oh, here we got one more coming in. What is or was your impression of Neil Johnson of Independence portraying President Truman? Um, I, Neil did a great job. I always, Neil and I, I've, Neil's been doing that forever. Um, I've, uh, I think I first met Neil portraying my grandfather nearly 30 years ago. And uh, Neil is such a nice, easygoing guy that, that I uh, almost immediately started calling him grandpa. I don't think I've called him Neil for years. Um, and I, the, the one thing that I hope we get to do at some point is that since I play grandpa now on stage and give him hell Harry, I hope we wind up in the same place at the same time, both dressed in costume just to see what happens. That, that might be an interesting presentation. <laughs> it might. <laughs> Truman versus Truman. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's all the questions that we have on here and uh, we're pretty much running out of time. So, um, I will uh, call on Most Worshipful Brother John Hess. Do you have anything further to add or? You know, I think maybe in conclusion, I just say, you know, it's a, masonry is such a family experience and having these family stories being told makes it just more real for all of us. And I thank uh, our good brother from Chicago. Thank you, John. It's always good to see you. All right, as, as we are Masons, and I happen to know that our Grand Master 
is on the Zoom call. So um, for the last word this evening, we will call upon Most Worshipful Brother Barry Cundiff for any comments he has. I have particularly enjoyed this talk. Uh, you can go learn about Harry Truman in a book, but you can't learn the things that we've learned tonight. It's enjoyable to hear the, the personal anecdotes, the personal stories. It, it was terrific. And I really appreciate Brother Daniels giving us this from his experience and his knowledge. And I look forward to hearing him again sometime. Thank you, Grandmaster. And I mean, when I heard you were on the call, I immediately sat up straighter. It's amazing how that works. <laughs> Yeah, it has that effect, doesn't it? I know. All right. Well, Clifton, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent presentation. Everybody is saying so in the chat. Um, we couldn't thank you enough. Uh, great presentation and a uh, lot of great information. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. That was fun. Thank you. Y'all have a good, uh, good week, safe week. Stay healthy. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Father Daniel. Thanks, Father Kaser. It was a great talk. And Grandmaster Kundiff and Grandmaster Hess, it was very nice to be here from your neighbors up north in Canada. <laughs> great. All right. OK.